We're going to commence this afternoon by reading from Deuteronomy chapter 32, the book of Deuteronomy, and the chapter 32. I welcome you all to the house of the Lord. We trust that the Lord will come near to us today and minister to our hearts as we lead together. Deuteronomy 32, and verse 3. Because I will publish the name of the Lord. Ascribe ye greatness unto our God. He is the rock. His work is perfect. For all his ways are judgment, for all his ways are just. God of truth, without iniquity, just and right is he. And as we live in a world of continual shifting sands, in a world of great Uncertainty, what a blessed thing to know that the Lord is the rock. His work is perfect. There are times that we do not understand the Lord's ways, and yet we know that they are just. They are perfect. There is no fault in our great God. We'll seek the Lord's face together, please, in prayer. Our gracious Father, we thank you, Lord, for the privilege to assemble ourselves here together this afternoon. And we pray that this season of worship will be sanctified by thyself. We pray, O oh Lord, that thou will be pleased to come near. And, Lord, that the presence of the Lord will be known in this season of worship. O oh Lord, we pray that all things will be done to the Lord's honour. So grant help, we pray in our Lord's great name. Amen. We're going to turn in our hymn books, please, to the words of the hymn number 50. The words of the hymn number 50. And in the hymn book, it's found in the page 196. Number 50. It's on the page 196. And in times of Unfaithfulness and upheaval, what a blessed thing it is to acknowledge the faithfulness of the Lord. Great is the faithfulness. Number 50, and we'll stand as we sing.
gathered together please in prayer. Let us ask the Lord to be pleased to come and to minister to us today in this season of worship together. Our gracious Father, how we do rejoice in the faithfulness of a faithful God. O oh Lord, we thank Thee that we come to the God who is called in Scripture the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. The God of covenant. The God of faithfulness. We thank Thee, O oh Lord, that Thou art El Shaddai, the Almighty. We thank Thee, dear Lord, that Thou art Jehovah Jireh. The Lord will provide and the Lord will see to it. And, o oh Lord, we thank Thee that what the Lord has spoken will come to pass. We thank Thee that the Lord does not speak and then withdraw His promise. But the Lord makes good that which He has spoken. And Lord, as we come to Thee this afternoon, we recognize that we are a people of unfaithfulness. We are a people of instability. But we thank Thee, Lord, for the faithfulness of our God. O oh Lord, we pray that in our time together, this afternoon, that uh, thou will be pleased to come and to minister to our waiting hearts. We thank thee that thy word is truth. And we thank thee that we do not come to the Bible as a dusty history book. But we come to the Bible knowing that it is the living word. And we thank thee that we don't come to the Bible wondering what errors have been made. We thank Thee that holy men spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. All Scripture is given by inspiration. All Scripture is breathed out by God. And o Lord, we pray then that the Holy Spirit will even write the living word upon our hearts this afternoon. We thank Thee for all that have gathered. We thank Thee for each family and home represented and we pray that your rich blessing will abide upon each home we ask of thee dear Lord that every family will know the mighty blessing of the Lord sustaining and we pray Lord that you will be pleased to save our children save loved ones that are far away from thee we do pray that in this congregation that we will know times of refreshing, times of blessing, times of building up. Therefore we look to Thee, O Lord, that our time today will indeed be owned and blessed of Thyself. O Lord, we pray that You'll minister to all of the children. We thank Thee for them. And, O oh Lord, it is an earnest desire that each one will be truly converted and go on and walk in the ways of the Lord. We recognize that we need a generation that will stand for Thee. And despite all of the difficulty of the day, we pray for a generation of young people whose hearts have been touched by the Lord. O oh Lord, we look to Thee also that You'll be pleased to have mercy upon our nation upon this state, upon this city. And Lord, we recognize the tragedy of such fear that there is upon the hearts of many. And oh Lord, we pray that the eyes of unconverted people will be open to see that in Christ there is peace that passes all understanding. O oh Lord, we thank Thee that Christ is the one to whom we run for our protection. And O oh Lord, we pray then for those that rule over us. We 
pray, dear Lord, that they will come to recognize that they give answer to Almighty God. Pray, O Lord, that they will administer that which is wise, godly. We pray then for thy mighty intervention, even in our own state at this time. We recognize that there are wicked plans. We pray that thou will be pleased to frustrate the plans of parliamentarians to bring in that which is contrary to the ways of the Lord. We pray, Lord, that our freedom to preach the word unhindered will be attained. We pray, Lord, for freedom to bring the gospel to people of all lifestyles, that that liberty will be maintained. And, oh Lord, we pray that even in a day of darkness, that the light of the gospel will shine in. Oh Lord, we as the church recognize that while revival starts in the church, that there needs to be a cleansing of the church. We pray that the church of Christ in these days will be humbled. That it will be looking on to thee for cleansing. We pray that we will see the church being strengthened and revived. O oh Lord, come then, we pray. Bless us in our time together. We pray in our Lord's great name. Amen. Amen. I want to welcome everybody this afternoon. Thank you all for coming. And we appreciate your willingness to have your plans changed to come at a later time, although I think some of you were glad for a little slower pace this morning, but we do appreciate nonetheless uh, you uh, cooperating and coming at this later time, and we trust the Lord will bless us in our uh, time together this afternoon. I'm going to ask your brother Bevis if he'll come and bring the message for the boys and girls, and so being the uh, Lord's Table today, there's no Sunday school, and um, obviously it would have been difficult today anyway, given the restrictions, but I think that's going to come with the message for the most of us. Morning boys and girls, a special welcome to the Lord's House today. We know that our Lord Jesus did not often become angry, and when he did it was with a righteous anger, but we know that he was very displeased when they wouldn't let the children come unto him. So please know there's a special welcome for you in the house of the Lord, and as you get older, please don't stay away from the house of the Lord for any reason, because there's a welcome for you. We're talking today about being created in the image of God. And I've said a few times that we would talk about it and I never quite seem to get there. So let's read from Genesis 1 verse 26. And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. And then at the end of the chapter in verse 31. And God saw everything that he had made and behold it was very good. And the evening and the morning were the sixth day. <coughs> Pardon me. When God created man and created the world, he looked at it and he said, it is very good. Now, it's maybe hard for us to understand that today, when we look at ourselves and the world around us, how does God say it was very good? But back then when he created Adam and Eve, before they sinned, there was nothing evil. Adam and Eve didn't see anything evil or hear anything evil. They were spiritually alive. They were happy. Their, their bodies were healthy, their minds were clear, they had no guilt weighing them down. You could say they were healthy and happy in body and in soul. And so when God created man, he created man with these two parts to him, his body and his soul. I'll just read a verse from David in Psalm 139, verse 14. He says, I will praise thee. For I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, and that my soul knoweth right well. So David looks at creation, he looks at his body and says, it's a wonderful thing. 
wonderful, marvelous creation of God, and my soul is able to appreciate that. My soul is able to know and understand that. Young people, if we were to ask the world's best scientists and surgeons to not just design the human body, that would be too hard to ask them, but to ask them just to assemble it, just to put the body parts together and make a man, how long do you think it would take them to do that? We think first they would have to build the, the frame or the skeleton of the man and it's got 206 <coughs> bones. It includes the, the chest and ribs bones which are there to protect our vital organs, to protect our heart, our lungs and the other organs within. We also have the skull which includes 22 bones. Can you imagine, especially for the boys as you grow up playing, Imagine if every time you bumped your head, you damaged your brain. It would be a problem. And so God designed it with us with a skull to protect our brains especially. So first they would have to assemble the structure. That's just the bones. <coughs> then they would have to fit over 600 muscles to the bones to hold it together. And some of those muscles are joined very tightly. Um, if you think of the hamstring muscle, but the hamstring comes from the hip to the knee, down the back there. It's three muscle groups intertwined. It's a very strong muscle and it's joined very tightly by the tendons. One ten tendons to the hip and the other to the knee. My father told me when he was running once in rugby and it snapped. It sounds like a spring snapping. That's how tightly it is joined. And so they would have to then join these 600 muscles to, uh, to the 206 bones. And then, only then have they just started. Now they have the basic body. But then they must fit the organs, the vital organs. We don't have time to talk about all of them, but there's the lungs. Our lungs must breathe about 20,000 times a day to oxygenate our blood. Must breathe in and out continually. And then there's the liver, which is the largest of the organs. An amazing organ, really. But if I had to say in, in simple terms, the liver is there to keep our blood clean. It's to make, keep our blood from its contaminations and keep it clean. The amazing thing about the liver is if you cut off a part of it, you can cut it in half or a quarter, you can fit part of that liver into someone else's body. And so some surgeons are clever enough to do that. But to give you an idea, we ask the question, how long would it take them to put all this together? Well, for them to fit just a part of the liver into someone else's body takes between 6 and 12 hours, depending how well the operation goes. Because they don't just sew it on, they have to join every blood vessel that comes out of the liver, liver into the, the new recipient. And then the liver that remains is able to grow back and grow again. And so it's a remarkable organ. And then there's our heart, which beats about 100,000 times a day. Imagine, 100,000 times, without us thinking, without us telling, to, telling it to, it does that. There's a surgeon in Birmingham Children's Hospital by the name of Dr. David Barron. He's obviously an exceptionally clever and capable surgeon because he is able to operate in the unborn babies, on the unborn baby's heart, in the womb, with tiny instruments that they were able to operate. So he's the head of cardiology for children at Birmingham. But he said in an interview, we cannot even come close to producing something that works with such efficiency and such beauty. And that is how he described the heart and how far man is from being able to copy it. But even if they were able to assemble all that, and we don't know how long it would take them, we do know this, God put all of that together in less than a day, on the sixth day of creation. And yet, I've spent all that time, and none of that describes how we are made in the image of God. Because God is a spirit. God does not have body parts. He, when it speaks of Him working by His hand or by His mighty arm, it writes that only so we can understand it. He doesn't have fingers and hands. Our Lord Jesus took on the likeness of our humanity. He became a man, but God is, is, is by nature does not have a body. So what is our likeness or our image 
of God in man. And it is this. It is that he has made us a living soul. You'll see on this slide, there's no pictures. Because I can't give you a picture of a soul. I'd have to take a photo of you and you. And then you'd have to imagine from there. All we can see is our bodies. But it is our soul that is made in the image of God. In Genesis 2 verse 7 it says, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground. He made his body from the dust of the ground. And he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living soul. That is you. You are alive because your soul is alive in you. And that soul consists of your mind, your ability to think. You're able to think for yourself. You're not like an animal who just does what comes by instinct. You're able to think, think through. And especially, you're able to read God's Word and understand it. You're able then to understand and know who God is from His Word. That is part of your soul. Then there is your will, that is your ability to choose. You're able to make your own choices, to decide between right and wrong. And then we also have our affections or our emotion. And often when the Bible uses the word heart in the Bible, it is speaking of this aspect of our souls. That is you. That is your, what you love and what you hate. Your affection and your emotion. Then in our souls we also have a conscience. That warns us and tells us when something is right and when it is wrong. When Adam and Eve sinned in the Garden of Eden, you must know their conscience was warning them, don't do this, this is wrong, there will be consequences, but they still continue that way. This makes us very different to the animals, young people. An animal does not have a conscience. I saw a documentary where a lion killed a hyena just for crossing its territory. The hyena was trying to get food for its young at home, and the lion just killed it. He didn't eat it, he didn't want to eat it, he just killed it, and then left it dying there. The lion doesn't go home and think, I shouldn't have done that. It wasn't really nice, and I didn't even want to eat it. The lion, the animals are not able to do that, but we have a conscience, and we must listen to our conscience. Luther says, it is neither safe nor reasonable to go against your conscience. And then there is this aspect of our ability to communicate with God, to have communion with God, which is because we are a living soul. God has breathed into us His breath of life. And it is that soul that never dies. So if I had to ask you, which is more important, the body or the soul, it should be an easy question. Because the body is made from dust and goes back to the dust. We will all prove that one day. But the soul never dies. It goes on forever. The Lord Jesus says in Matthew chapter 16, verse 26, What would you give in exchange for your soul? It is worth more than all of the world. What can you exchange for it? Or I forget how that verse itself goes. Matthew chapter 16, verse 26. Lord says, for what is a man profited if he will gain the whole world and lose his own soul? In other words, your soul, your one soul, is worth more than the rest of the world put together, if you had to put a value on it. And we have some idea of the value of the soul when we see what it takes to redeem a lost soul. You and I have sold ourselves to sin from the day we were born, young people. You're no different to me. You were a sinner when you were born, and you have proved it by the way you've lived since. And what does it take to buy back a soul that is sold in sin? It takes the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. It takes the blood of the only begotten Son of God. That is the worth of your soul. That God would not let you go on in your sin to an eternity without Christ, without grace, but was willing to send His Son to die for your sin. I ask you, do you not love Him? For paying the price for your soul. Come, let's pray. Our loving and gracious Heavenly Father, we marvel our God at the wonder of your creation. Truly, we are fearfully and wonderfully made. And Lord, we mourn when we consider our sinfulness against the Holy God who made us. We thank you, our God, for the gift of your Son, that he was willing to take on our human flesh. Willing to dwell with man, 
to suffer and die, to shed his blood for our sins. We wonder, our God, at the greatness of your love, that you would not withhold from us your dear Son to die for our sins, and you do not withhold your Holy Spirit to come and indwell even these sinful vessels. <clears throat> Lord, we wonder at the greatness of your love, and we thank you for our Saviour, for him who loved us and gave himself for us. We thank you in Jesus' name. Thank you, Bevis, for bringing that message to the boys and girls and to us all. May the Lord bless those thoughts to our hearts. Next Lord's Day morning, our brother Bevis will be preaching. God willing, the entire congregation will be back together again. Uh, next Lord's Day morning, God willing, I'm preaching down in Harrisdale at the Aboriginal congregation down there. I appreciate your prayers for that time. I've also beginning of the week of going to away for a few days. Her brother Neil will be bringing the message on Wednesday at the Bible study and prayer meeting. And next Lord's Day after the morning service during Sunday school time, brother Charles will be bringing the message at the adult class. I appreciate all of these men helping over the next few days. The following week will be the Barnyard Bible Club and we trust that We'll be able to go ahead with this, so that will be Monday the 12th through until Wednesday the 13th each morning at 10 uh, through until midday and all of the children are welcome to come along uh, to that Bible club. We're going to have our offering ahead, we're actually turning to the Psalm section and it's Psalm 146, the Psalm 100. And 46, page 135. This is Psalm 146, on page 135. Praise ye the Lord, and praise my soul. I'll praise God while I live. So 100, Psalm 146. And I chose this hymn, or this psalm rather, because of verse 5. Happy is that man and blessed, whom Jacob's God doth aid. And we're going to come in a moment or two. And think about Jacob waiting on the Lord's salvation. All those of us who are waiting and looking to the Lord, happily, is such. We're going to sing the first six verses, remaining sealed as the offering is received. <laughs> We're
We're going to turn in God's Word to Genesis chapter 49, please. Genesis chapter 49. And initially we'll read from the beginning of the chapter, and then we'll come down to the part of the chapter that I want us to look at today. Genesis 49, and Jacob called on to his sons and said, Gather yourselves together, that I may tell you that which shall befall you in the last days. Gather yourselves together, and hear, ye sons of Jacob, and hearken unto Israel, your father. And so Jacob then begins to address these men around the bed, Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Zebulun, and verse 14, Issachar is a strong ass couching down between two birds, and he saw that rest was good, and the land that it was pleasant, and bowed his shoulders to bear, and became a servant on the tribute. Dan shall judge his people as one of the tribes of Israel. Dan shall be a serpent by the way. Adder in the path that biteth the horse hates, so that his rider shall fall backward. I have waited for thy salvation, O Lord. And this is verse 18 that I want to leave with you, especially today, though I want us to think about this car and Dan as well. But I have waited for thy salvation, O Lord. We'll seek the Lord's face together in prayer. We need the Lord's help as we consider his truth together. Let us each pray. Our gracious Father, we thank thee that thy word is truth. We thank thee that the word of God is forever settled in heaven. And O oh Lord, we need your help as we come and spend this season in meditation upon the truth of God. O Lord, be pleased today to give great help as we consider thy truth together and write thy word upon every heart we do ask. In the Lord's great name we pray. Amen. Amen. Most of us don't want to wait in vain. During the past week I read a very unusual story of a man who went to a bus stop on a Sunday, but this bus stop was on a route where there was no Sunday service. And someone driving past felt it would be wise to warn the man that he was going to be waiting in vain. So they stopped and said to him, there is no bus on this route on a Sunday. And the man replied most unusually. He said, I know that. But I want to know what it is to wait in vain. I don't think there's many of us would want to be in that man's club. We don't like to wait, never mind to know that we would be waiting in vain. But it was no vain wait that Jacob had. When he said here in verse 18, I have waited for thy salvation, O Lord. Now if we were to read these words in any part of scripture, how wonderful they would be. But I think there's something wonderful about the context in which these words are actually given to us. In Holy Scripture. Because remember Jacob here. Is addressing. These sons. And he is speaking. Prophetically. He is speaking of. What lies before. These tribes that are represented. In these sons. And so he has addressed. The sons of Leah. Beginning with Reuben the firstborn. And he has now come. To address the first of the sons of the maid. So he addresses the first son of B. 
Bilha Issachar. And the other sons of the maid surely are standing with him. They're asking what's going to be said to me. But Jacob breaks as it were. And he brings these words of great exclamation. I have waited for thy salvation, O Lord. And it's as if he cannot restrain himself. And wise it is that he didn't restrain himself. It's as if he cannot wait until the end of all that's said before he brings these great words. He bursts into notes, uh, a note of yearning as well as praise. I have waited for thy salvation, O Lord. As I was preparing this message, I noticed something that I don't think I had appreciated before. That is, this is the first time the word salvation is found in the Bible. Now, undoubtedly, we, we read the concept of salvation earlier than this, but the actual word is used here for the first time. And the word has this idea of deliverance. It's the same word that was used at the Red Sea, where the Lord's command was, stand still and see the salvation of your God. Now as Jacob states this, I have waited for thy salvation, O Lord. What is the waiting that he's talking about? Is it talking about his waiting for Israel to be delivered from her enemies? Is he talking about waiting for the Canaanites to be driven out and for what was to be the tribes of Israel to go in and conquer? Was he referring to his own death? And undoubtedly he was thinking much about those that had gone before him. That soon he was to join them in glory. And I've shown you evidence of that earlier. How Jacob looks back and he states concerning various of these men. Leah had got it right when she said, so for example, Leah had got it right when she said, Judah, praise. So, what is Jacob meaning here? I am waiting to be delivered from my limp that I've had all these years. Was he saying, I'm waiting to be delivered from this bad eyesight? That may be part of it. Jacob was looking for more than Jacob was looking for the Messiah. It's no coincidence that in the verse previous, verse 17, Jacob makes mention of the serpent. And what a tragic thing it is that he is saying here that one of my sons would be in some ways serpent-like, devil -like. Remember right back in Genesis 3, the devil there appears as a serpent. Remember there was that great prophecy spoken in Genesis 3. That the seed of the woman would crush, bruise the head of Satan. And that seed of course is the Messiah, our Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus would come to crush Satan's head. And I believe that that is what Jacob has in mind here. I have waited for this promise to be fulfilled. He had not seen the coming of the Messiah in his day. His sons would not see the Messiah come in their day. Or generations follow it. But when we come to the Gospel of Luke. We read of another old man near the end of his life. That was Simeon. Remember when baby Jesus was brought into the temple? Old Simeon was there. Luke 2 verse 29. He says, Lord, now let us thy servant depart in peace. He says, I can die now. 
Because all my life I've been like those Old Testament saints. All my life, like Jacob, I have been waiting. I have been waiting for thy salvation. And when he saw the baby Jesus, his eyes was opened. His eyes were opened to see this. Salvation had come. The Messiah had been born. And so he says, Luke 2, 30. For mine eyes have seen thy salvation. And so then if we come back to our text, verse 30. I have waited for thy salvation. Now, are we to say that this has nothing to do with us? Are we to say that we are not waiting? Not at all. For there is a sense in which these ought to be the very words that we as God's people are saying today. I have waited. I am waiting for thy salvation. You see the word salvation is used in a threefold sense in scripture. It's used in a threefold sense in terms of time. The Christian can say, I have been saved. My sin is dealt with. The penalty of my sin has been taken by Jesus Christ and his work on the cross. So I have been saved. I will not be in hell. I am forgiven. Salvation in that sense is something that has happened in the past for us who are believers. But then we can also say, I am being saved. In this sense, that the Lord has not given up on us. The Lord continues to do a work in us. We are being transformed more and more into his image. And this has to do then with being saved from the power of sin. That more and more we should know victory in our Christian lives. I have been saved, I am being saved, and then thirdly, I will be saved. I will be saved. And in this sense we are looking to our Lord's coming again. That we are going to be delivered from all Present infirmity. We are going to be delivered from all present hindrances. We are going to be delivered from the very presence of sin. I will be saved. And this is the third sense that I want you to think of today as we take this text. I have waited. I am waiting for thy salvation. I am waiting for the Lord's coming again. I am looking for that day when the Lord shall come in power and great glory. And so then, I have entitled the message, Waiting for God's Salvation. And I want to say, first of all, that our waiting is bound up in a person. Our waiting is bound up in Person. But this word salvation that Jacob uses is the word from which the name, the proper name, Joshua comes from. So the name Joshua means deliverer, saviour. Now what is significant about that is that when Joshua, which is a Hebrew word, is translated into Greek, it is Jesus. So Jesus' name is Joshua. Salvation. Remember how Joseph had that explained to him. You're to call him Jesus because he will save. He will be a savior. He will be a Joshua. He will save his people from their sins. And so as Jacob here is on his deathbed, he gets a view of this. And so he sees that from the line of Judah will come the Messiah. The Lion of the tribe of Judah. And we saw last time that Jesus will, or Jesus would dwell in Galilee, in a land that belonged to Zebulun. He would dwell there. And so Jacob's mind 
was being brought to think of this coming Messiah. But the two prophecies just immediately prior to this great statement are certainly not as warm as the one spoken to Judah and to Zebulun. In verse 14 we read of Issachar and in verse 16 of Dan. And I'm going to come back to these in a moment or two. But the name Issachar comes from a Hebrew word meaning higher. H-I-R-E. And from that word higher, you get this idea in Hebrew of reward. So Issachar bears out this idea of reward. And Issachar then was given this name and it carried great intention. He was to do great things. His seed were to do great things. But instead of that, we read at the end of verse 15 that Issachar became, and of course this is a prophecy uh, he's going to become, but he became a servant unto tribute. Instead of Issachar Hiring and taking reward. Issachar is going to be hired. He's going to be a servant paying tax unto others. He's going to be under servitude. And then the name Dan means judge. And it speaks there in the verse... 16, Dan shall judge his people as one of the tribes of Israel. And one of the great judges of the book of Judges does come from the tribe of Dan. That was Samson. And Samson, we could say, was Dan's greatest son. Which in some ways is something of a disappointment. Now there are many things about Samson that are wonderful. And Hebrews 11 does commend him as a man of faith. And yet in so many ways, Samson fell short. And that was like a tribe of time. And what I want you to see today is this. That these two tribes would fail. And so what Jacob is saying in effect is this. It's not enough to have Issachar. It's not enough to have Dan. We need this Messiah to come. We need the promised seed. We need one who will not fail. We need Jesus Christ. This is the great message of the scriptures then. No matter who we look to, they will disappoint. With this exception, our Lord Jesus Christ, he would come to bring reward. Revelation 22, 12, our Lord says, I come quickly and my reward, my Issachar, is with me. Our Lord is the great judge. And so we just take these two names as far as their meaning is concerned, they do bring us to consider Jesus Christ, Issachar, reward. We think of the unconverted. The unconverted will stand before God and the unconverted will receive their reward. The due reward for their deeds. They will receive Justice from the judge. Dan. And so Jesus Christ then is the righteous judge. The sinner will stand before Almighty God, stand before our Lord Jesus. Remember how judgment has been given into the hand of the Son. And he will judge in righteousness. There will be no flaw in Christ's judgment. The sinner will receive his reward. And no wonder then Jacob says, I have waited for thy salvation. He 
saw the need. The sinner needs the Savior. Uh, maybe there's someone today in the meeting and you're not yet converted. And it's true, you're waiting. But it's not the waiting of our text. Your waiting is the waiting of procrastination. You keep putting the matter off. You keep saying, yes, I need to be saved, but not today. What an awful way to live. salvation. And if we think then of these two names in relation to the believer, before we move on, and the Lord does give a reward to the believer. When we stand before God, we will be rewarded. I always find that an amazing thing, that we are going to be rewarded for our good works when uh, our good works are so lacking. How is it that we're rewarded? We are rewarded for the very thing Christ has done in us. There's nothing that the natural man can do to please God. And if there's anything in the believer that pleases God and we're rewarded for it, it comes back to God's grace. How amazing is grace. As we stand before Christ the judge, there'll be a declaration of innocence because the judge has taken mentioned how Dan is associated with the snake. I'll come back to that in a moment or two. But Dan is likened on to this snake that would go after the horse. He wants to take down the rider, so what does he do? The snake goes to the heels of the horse. There's nothing sly about Jesus Christ. There's nothing Serpent life. His holy heart the sun Do you guys remember it said of him, or he said of himself, that he would be like the serpent on the pole, John 3 14. I wonder if you ever thought about that. Christ likened to a serpent. How can that be? Because he was made sin for us. Our condemnation was taken. Lay on him. Salvation is bound up in a person. I want to see then, secondly, that our waiting is intensified by seeing sin. Our waiting is intensified by seeing sin. But just to explain. That the waiting here, remember, has to do with this waiting for our Lord's coming again. We're looking to the Lord for that great day. And as we see sin in ourselves, and we see sin around us, this yearning, come Lord Jesus, is to be increasing. So we're never to be happy about sin. But the reality of sin is to cause this yearning to be intensified. So I want us to think about this. The words about Issachar and Dan reminded Jacob of his own sin. And we don't have time to go through everything that I have for you today, but I would encourage you to go back and look at some of these details later. The birth of Issachar was in very sad circumstances. The reason why Issachar was given that name was in very sad circumstances. There was this great conflict between Leah and Rachel. And remember how Rachel had all of Jacob's attention. And one day Reuben, Leah's eldest son, had gone out to the fields and he found some mandrakes. And the mandrakes were roots very particular route, but it was associated with superstition, a superstitious belief about fertility. And when Reuben brought the mandrax back home, Rachel saw them. So remember, Reuben is Leah's son, but Rachel sees the mandrax. 
She wants. Rachel is angry about that. Sorry, Leah is angry about that. Uh, and she says, you took my husband. Now you're going to take my mandrakes as well. And so there's bargaining between the two women. And the outcome is, Rachel says, you can have Jacob tonight. And in the evening, Rachel went out to meet Jacob coming home. Sorry, Leah goes out to meet Jacob going, coming home. And Leah says to Jacob, you're going to be with me tonight. I have hired you. I have hired you. And Jacob concedes. And he spends the night with Leah. And Issachar is conceived. And so he's given this name, hired. Now you think about that act, that whole scene. The Bible doesn't cover up the awful sins of its heroes. We think of what went on there. And as Jacob looks back, surely he has to see how wrong he acted. What way was it for a man of God to live like that? To hire himself out as it were to the highest bidder. To give in to all of that superstitious dealing. As he thinks about that he says I have waited for thy salvation. He sees his sin. This is why he is a savior. And then he comes to talk about Dan. And again, Dan's birth was in very sad circumstances. The conception of Dan was in very sad circumstances. Rachel had no children. She was getting infuriated. She was getting desperate. She was getting angry with Jacob as well as resentful of Leah. And so she had this plan, I'm going to help God out. Jacob can have my meat. And when the maid conceives, I will have a child then through the maid. What does Jacob do? Instead of believing in confidence that God would give Rachel a child, he conceives. And to add sin to sin, when the child is conceived, Rachel believes her plan was the right one. She said, God has judged me. God has vindicated me. I did the right thing. And so Dan was given the name Dan, judge. Vindicated. And of course, nothing was further from the truth. But Jacob could look back and say, how terrible. What way was that for the man of God to live? As he reflected back and saw fear, he was to lift up his eyes and see hope in the person of Christ. But then the words about Issachar and Dan showed that Jacob's uh, there would be it showed Jacob future failure. There would be future failure in these tribes. And so we'll think for a few moments about these tribes. Verse 14. Issachar is a strong ass, a strong donkey. And the word strong here is actually translating a Hebrew word that means bony. And sometimes we say bony today, we mean skin and bone. It's not a compliment. But it's bony here in the idea of being strong boned, big boned. So it's a strong donkey. But what's the strong donkey do? The strong donkey did have two burdens, these two weights that were on either side, so it's a bit like a, a saddle bag. But he's not carrying anymore. The donkey's lying in the sand. He has the strength to carry it. Verse 15, he 
he saw the rest was good and the land was pleasant. It's all nice here. Why should I work? The tribe of Issachar would be a very strong tribe. In Numbers 26, we read about the number of mighty men there were in the tribes. Issachar is third top on that list. It's a strong tribe. There was great potential. And yet we come to the book of Judges. We see some men that the Lord raised up. There's only one judge that came from the tribe of Issachar. Some of you will be struggling to remember ever reading about Tola. He brought deliverance. He judged for 23 years and he was gone. That's all we know about him. And that was really summing up the tribe of Issachar. They did a little. The donkey carried the burden so far and then just stopped. Judges 1, again we read of the success of some of the tribes, Judah and Simeon, in driving out the enemies, and we read of the failure of some of the other tribes, one of them in particular Manasseh, they did not drive out the Canaanites, which they were to do, but they put them to tribute, so what that means, they made a compromise, they said, if you pay us tax, we'll allow you to stay. Which was just another way of saying we don't want to do the fighting the Lord has given us to do. But interestingly, Issachar is not in that chapter. She was worse. Instead of her asking the Canaanites for taxation, the Canaanites were asking her for taxation. She willingly put herself into bondage. At the end of verse 15, became a servant unto tribute. When David became king over all the tribes, and great numbers of people came to welcome and rejoice in that great scene. 37,000 men from Naphtali, 40,000 men from Asher, 120,000 men from Reuben and Gad. How many came from Issachar? Two hundred. Two hundred. Now the two hundred men that came were wise men. Heads. And they were very wise. It talks about how they'd understand at the times they knew what was to be done. And the children of Israel as a whole took the advice of the men of Issachar. But I believe the great tragedy there is this. They could tell the tribes what they had to do. But they couldn't motivate their own tribe to do anything. Issachar is a donkey. A strong donkey. But lying in the sand. She says, I've done enough. When it came to the time of the divided kingdom, remember how after the time of Solomon, it wasn't just one unified nation. It was divided again. Jeroboam was king. And a man of Issachar had a revolt. Jeroboam was overthrown and it was right that Jeroboam should be overthrown. But the Asha did what so many political leaders today do when there's an overthrow. He just did the very things that Jeroboam did. So it looked like there could be reform, reformation, transformation. Jeroboam was dead. The donkey lay down in the sand. We've done enough. Jacob would look forward. See that failure. Disappointment. He saw what was going to happen to Dan. In verse 17, Dan shall be the serpent. path that bites the horses, the horse heels. 
Dan was allocated territory like all the tribes were. But again, Dan didn't have the fight. There was land to be claimed. What did Dan do? Dan allowed the enemies to remain and went further north to try and claim land that would be a bit easier to conquer. There was this serpent-like aspect to the tribe of Dan. And there was also this serpent-like character in that it was the tribe of Dan that brought in much of the idolatry. The two golden calves in 1 Kings 12 is traced back to the tribe of Dan. Idolatry at the end of the book of Judges is the tribe of Dan. Here are two men. They were, and their descendants were, a disappointment. Jacob looks into the eyes of his son and he sees, You're not the answer. We need the Messiah. Now I bring out this thought to remind you then, that as we look at our own sin, it is to cause us to yearn for glory. As we see sin in others and sin around us, it's to cause us to yearn for our Lord's coming again. And I'm sure there are very few or any of us here today that have no regrets. You look back in life and there are things you said you wish you never had spoken. Things you did, you wished they had never been done. Thoughts you had, you wished they had never entered your mind. But you look back. It's to cause you to yearn for glory when there'll be no such thoughts, words, or deeds. As you look around and you see the sin in others, you yearn to be in an atmosphere that is entirely pure. In a state we're surrounded by filth. But it is to make us to yearn for home. And so in Romans chapter 7, Paul is talking there about the great dilemma that there is in the Christian. The flesh lusting, striving against the spirit. The old man fighting against the new. And there's this battle that goes on in the life and the heart of the Christian every day. And Paul reflecting on that, he says, Oh, wretched man that I am. He sees his own failure, his own sin, his own Issachars and Dan's. Oh, wretched man that I am. Who shall deliver me from the body of this death? And so when he sees the sin, he's then yearning. I need deliverance. I have waited for thy salvation, O Lord. He goes on to say, how that waiting is not in vain. There's no condemnation to us, to us here in Christ. We're not separated from the love of Christ. May we have that yearning then today to be out of the world. Now we're not to yearn in the sense that we go before our time. What has been emphasized, we're never to be content with this world. It's never to be our home. We're always yearning to go home to glory. Our waiting is intensified by seeing sin. Then I want to see lastly our waiting is to be accompanied by action. You think again about this donkey. It has all the strength it needs. It's lying down, it's lazy. And as we wait for our Lord's coming again. Not to be like the donkey in the sand. So some have got this idea that waiting for the Lord means that I do as little as possible. And nowhere to be busy. We're to use our time.
that well? It would be like the ant, Solomon says. Our Lord said, occupy till I come. Occupy, be busy. Just to be activity. We're not to be like Dan. We're not to be like this serpent. There's nothing to be devilish about our action. We're not to be scheming. We're to desire to do God's work God's way. We desire to live as the Lord would have us to live. Not giving in to idolatry. But living lives of integrity. As we wait, are we busy? Are we working? Are we laboring? May the Lord so help us to do. In Romans 13, verse 11. And Paul says there, Now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. And this salvation in that verse is certainly in this sense that I'm emphasizing today. Our salvation is nearer than the day we got saved. It's talking about this day when we'll be brought home to the Lord. Paul says then it's high time to wake out of sleep. We don't wait, we don't sleep in the time of waiting. We're to be awake. Hebrews 9 28, Christ was once offered to bear the sins of men. And all to them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin. On to salvation. He will appear for our salvation. He will bring us the whole way home to the Lord. Let us rejoice then today that there is a Savior. Let us rejoice in all that lies before the believer. Let us press on in the service of our Lord. We'll bow together, please, in prayer. Let us ask the Lord to write his word upon our heart, to give us help in applying the word to each of our individual lives. There's some area of your life that the Lord has put his finger upon today. May you know grace even to be obedient unto the word of truth. Our gracious Father, take thy word, we pray, and write it upon our hearts. And, O oh Lord, we do pray that we will rise up even from this place. Not as a donkey in sand, but a laboring one. Not as a serpent in this sense of trickery, but as wise as serpents, as harmless as doves. O Lord, we look to thee as we come to the table, that we will know your help in that time. And be pleased to draw near. And O Lord, we pray that we will be led afresh. Calvary. Grant thy